campus of Stanford University. People are worried about data. They're worried about their privacy and their security. They should be. We need secure systems. This is the future of everything. But we can't have a system that closes that data off. It is too rich of a source of inspiration, innovation, and discovery for new things in medicine. With your host, Russ Altman. Today on The Future of Everything, the future of computer graphics and audio-visual media. Many of us may remember the philosopher Marshall McLuhan, who coined the phrase, the medium is the message, in the 1960s. I'm by no means an expert on this, but it's a pretty accessible and compelling idea. The general idea is that the way in which audio, visual, sensory messages are sent is at least as important, if not more important, than the message that the, the content and the message that they are trying to convey. He looked at media as conveying messages uh, based on their form. Movies show rapid sequences of events, but they don't have to obey time. You can have flashbacks, you can have flash forwards, and so the message is about life uh, is not as linear as you might have thought it was before movies. Printed media like newspapers present a hodgepodge of items laid out in a haphazard way, but when you read one, it's in a linear form and it's in a pretty standard format with the lead, the body, you know, some conclusion. Pretty predictable. And I think we all know that audiovisual media have exploded and changed markedly in the last 50 years since Marshall gave us this, uh, this soundbite. A computer, computer media in particular are dominating our senses. In many ways, media have converged into computers. We used to have vinyl records. We now have files that have music, like MP3s. We used to have movies. Now we have MPEGs and other video formats. We had TV, but now we have short-form video films. We had telephones, but we use Skype now. We read newspapers, and now we look at them online. So of course, the boundaries change. We can mix sound, video, words on a page in ways that we never could imagine before we had these capabilities. And so the medium is new, and the medium is sending us a new message, whatever that is. These capabilities also raise challenges. They raise technical challenges. How do we create editing tools for a human to mix all of these media in a way that creates a compelling, uh, exciting, informative experience for, for, the, for the listener, the user, whatever they are? Do humans even need to get involved in this editing, or are we going to have little droids who are doing it for us because they understand what we like and they feed us what we like? And with the content in digital form, can we slice it and dice it in new ways to create experiences for our audience that are unlike anything they've had before? My guest today is Professor, professor Manish Agrawala, Professor of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering and Director of the Brown Institute for Media Innovation. He's an expert at computer graphics, human-computer interactions, visual, visualization, and he studies how we can design these media to be more effective. Now, Manisha, Manish, every time we tape an interview for the future of everything, my producer edits my interviews. He removes my mistakes, my ums, my coughs. I probably just had several of them, which many of you will never hear. Thank you, Brian. Uh, you, can cr you, Manish, create these very powerful tools to uh, simultaneously edit video and sound. And this can create smooth as silk dialogue, easy to listen to, understandable. As you well know, it can also be used to potentially create what you might call fake news. Uh, stringing together words that maybe I said or maybe I didn't even say, but you know how to synthesize to have me say things I never said. How do you think that this slippery slope from fixing up my speech to making me say things I never said, how do we think about that? What is the pros and the cons of that as we go forward? Yeah, <laughs> that's a big question. So, um, you know, journalists have had to grapple with this question for a very long time. Um, uh, when you are uh, presenting an interview in audio or video form, there's always uh, the ability to edit that interview to a few quotes. Yes. To fix up the uhs and the ums and the coughs and the <laughs> stutters and and that kind of thing, um, and uh, and journalists uh, use that ability to make the interview clearer, right? Uh, yes. By it, it, by doing that kind of distractions editing, go away. We right. Can focus on what you're saying. Right. And 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 so it's it's applied very very judiciously, uh, but journalists have to constantly think about. Uh, what kind of editing they're doing 
to make sure that it isn't uh, manipulating the message yes. of the subject. Are they typically trained on how to do that? Is that part of journalism education? Is the boundaries there? I think I think it is. I think it's something that is uh, instilled in journalism programs pretty deeply. Um, but it's something that you constantly have to think about. There's no, I, I wouldn't say there are, there are really hard rules. <laughs> yes. Except that you want to, you know, convey the, the truth of what happened. So, so the reason I started with that question is I have had the pleasure of looking at some of the videos that your group very generously kind of puts up on the web and some really amazing editing tools. And you have some demos where uh, you can pause the face of the person to give them a more pregnant pause to make their next sentence a little bit more uh, impactful. Um, can you just tell us about the basic capabilities that you're trying to build in the lab at the technical level for like what should we be able to do in terms of editing these media uh, quickly and easily so that it doesn't take forever to do? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, if you've ever edited audio or video, you know that uh, what you spend all of your time doing is essentially scrubbing a timeline. You scrub it to navigate the raw material, and often you will capture hours and hours of raw material. Uh, maybe it's interview footage, uh, maybe it's uh, you know people talking in various in various configurations, uh, and you'll capture hours and hours of this stuff. It has to be edited down to just a few minutes that are going to appear in the final product. Yes, and um, in order to do that editing. Uh, the first thing that many of us do is we start by just looking at the raw footage and logging what happened. That essentially means writing down what happened and time stamping it. Right. So he you're... said something good at two minutes and 40 seconds. That's right. That's right. We should use that. But from three minutes to four minutes, he was kind of boring. Yeah. I'm talking about me, not the guest. <laughs> and it is uh, very, very time consuming, as you can imagine, because you're constantly scrubbing the slider, listening, writing stuff down, going back and, you know, writing it down again. And you miss something. It's extremely tedious. Um, so one of the things that we've done in our work is recognize that um, a lot of the content in this kind of media is conveyed by the speech. And today, we can get a really high quality transcript of the speech, a text transcript, and, uh, and then time align that with the audio, with wow. the speech. So when you say the word hello, it'll be time aligned, <laughs> the text will be time aligned to that word, so you can click on the word hello and it'll take you to that part of the video. And we're okay. pretty good at reading and quickly finding what's interesting in the written materials. That's right, and reading is much, much faster than scrubbing through a timeline. So this really helps with navigating the raw material. You can quickly find what you wanna, you know, what you wanna use in the, yes. in the final edit. Um, but then we can go beyond that. So then we can uh, do cut, copy, paste on the text, just like you would in a word processor, and propagate that to the audio or video. This um, is the exciting yet scary part of the whole thing. Really amazing. Please yeah, continue. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So that's the the really cool thing because now you can edit. Uh, audio and video just like you would edit a text document. Um, and that uh, speeds things up uh, immensely. <laughs> so if there's a cough sound in the transcript or Russ says um too much, <laughs> Brian, my producer, he's a very skilled man, uh, can say, I'm going to select cough and um <laughs> and delete. Yeah. And you will uh, know where in both the video and the soundtrack to take that cough and that um and really literally make them disappear and then re-splice together the moment before the and moment after. That's right. So uh, we know exactly where the um is because we've time aligned it with the transcript and the transcript contains all of the uhs and ums and stutters and so on. Um, and so we can delete the um. And of course, you can join the audio, <laughs> um, but you can also join the video. And typically, uh, if you just join the video, you'd get what's called a jump cut. Yes. And, you know, the head would jump around a little right, because bit. Because I moved a little bit or whatever. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things that we've developed is a way to uh, generate additional frames that will smooth out that jump cut so you won't notice that there's a jump cut. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman and I'm speaking with our guest, Professor Manish Agrawala about media 
and we were just speaking about jump cuts. So let, let's think about that because, yes, I think you, everybody can imagine that if you take a video and you cut it and go to a future moment, it won't be a continuous, smooth. Um, and so tell us a little bit about what exactly do you do in these, in, in these frames that you're creating um, kind of to help smooth that transition? What yeah. are the principles by which we do that? Right. So, um, you know, the thing that we're doing is uh, we have the two endpoints of the cut, yep. and we are trying to find additional frames wherever they might occur in the video that we can insert in there to produce a smooth transition. Yes. Okay. And typically, because you have hours and hours of material and you're editing it down to just a few minutes, you have lots and lots of frames of the person, you know, doing various things with their head and, um, and, and their hand motions and so on. So you can find other frames and other parts of the video that you can use in that transition to bridge across and smoothly get from the start to the finish. So you're speaking about, makes perfect sense, kind of harvesting the other footage. Mm -hmm. But we also know that in, for example, in the, in the Hollywood movie industry, there's the computer graphics that they can create lots of very realistic um, fake frames. Mm -hmm. And so can you imagine a future or, or, or are you already working on saying, you know what, he never quite adopted the pose that I need for a tr smooth transition, but I have plenty of raw data about the colors and the shades and the movements that I'm just going to create some computer generated movements to get him from A to B. Yeah, absolutely. So we and other colleagues are uh, working on uh, making it so that uh, you can take human actors and essentially, uh, you know, type in text and have them say the text in a very believable, realistic way in video and audio. So we're generating both things. Fascinating. Now, I know that your your work is remarkably wide ranging, and moving from just audio and visual speech, I know you've been you've looked at musical scores. Mm -hmm. Can we do much? Tell us about your work with musical scores. You can imagine doing similar things, but but I can also imagine doing other things with music. I know that you've tried to match scores to scenes. Mm -hmm. What's up with all that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, all of this really started when I was on sabbatical a few years ago. Uh, I went to WNYC in New York City, where they produce a number of radio programs. Um, and I was always fascinated by how they produce such compelling stories. And one of the things that they do there uh, is they will add a musical score to help highlight different parts of a story. Right. Okay, and um, the score uh, has a, a particular form. So often they will uh, start with the music kind of low and in the background underneath the person that's speaking, um, and then right after the person makes an important point, they'll bring up the music, <laughs> wow. and there'll be an audible change in the music, and uh, and they'll play the music at kind of full volume for a few seconds. To kind of cue the audience that what you just heard was a dramatic thing. Exactly. In case you weren't listening. Exactly. And then, <laughs> and then they'll you know turn the audio back down, and they will have the person speak again. This, and, th th more on this in a moment. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Manish Agarwala about some amazing abilities to manipulate music and really um, help people with their emotions in many ways. So please go on. Yeah. So, uh, so we thought, well, you know, it's a lot of work to go in and add these scores really carefully to particular points in the music. And what we developed was a tool where you could mark the point in the speech that you want to highlight. And the system... And you would also select a music track. Yes. Um, and the system would then automatically place the music. So there's a little intro to the music. It's a build up uh, to a change point in the music. Align that change point with the point in the speech that you want to highlight. Automatically adjust the volume. Uh, play it at full volume. Uh, for a few seconds and then bring it back down afterwards. So now does somebody have to listen to the music and mark it like, hey, this is a, an emotional upsurge moment. This is a background uh, just playing around moment. Do, do you need that kind of annotation of the music so that you can say, please get me a moment in this song when there's a crescendo because I need a crescendo type moment because, the, because my guest just said something that was, you know, 
earth shattering. Right. So we have automated ways of finding wow. those kinds of moments where the music changes. Uh, and music often has this characteristic where uh, it will be uh, repeated measures of kind of similar uh, melody and rhythm. And then there, there will be points where new instrument, in, new instrumentation is introduced or um, uh, the melody changes a little bit yes. or the rhythm changes a little bit. And those are the important change points that help cue the listener that uh, something has happened in the speech. How do the sound engineers, for example, like my producer Brian, uh, how do they respond to this technology? Is this making their lives better or are they starting to look for retraining opportunities? <laughs> we get a lot of concern. <laughs> um, but our tools are really designed to remove the tedious work that's involved in doing the editing, but we want to always design them so that the high-level decisions are still made by people. So the, the person decides on the music track to use, right? Yes. The person has to mark where in the speech uh, you, you want to highlight the speech. Yes. And those are really, really important decisions that require a lot of semantic understanding. And we believe those should be given to the, and those, to the So editor. they become super users with just extremely powerful tools at their, at their fingertips to kind of just do a better job at what they're already quite good at. That's right. And, and you know, so, so we want to help them by uh, reducing the tedious work. Um, and we also want to make it so that whatever we produce in the end uh, is fully editable. So you don't just get the final result. You also get it in a form that you can load into your favorite editor, like Pro Tools or uh, Audition or whatever, and uh, further modify if necessary. So that allows you to, so to speak, keep the channels separately, separate mm -hmm. so that if they, they, if they need to be mixed and matched differently, you can still bring that human kind of refinement at the, at the end of the process. That's right. I think that's really, really important. Have they deployed this? Are we, are we listening to... Um, shows that have been engineered with some of these technologies? So some of the tools have been, uh, you know, are starting to appear uh, in various forms. Uh, you can you can get you can download them on the web. A lot of our tools are also available uh, uh, as open source code. Um, uh, but we haven't really seen anyone incorporate the tools in a in a wholesale way yet. Right. Uh, I think it's coming. Yes. Yeah. This is The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Manish Agrawala about media, editing, and the opportunities for advanced distribution and creation of new – I'm going to have to say that again. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, world. Uh, this is The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Manish Agrawala on media, audiovisual, visualization, and human-computer interactions next on Sirius XM Insight 121. From the campus of Stanford University. People are worried about data. They're worried about their privacy and their security. They should be. We need secure systems. This is the future of everything. But we can't have a system that closes that data off. It is too rich of a source of inspiration, innovation, and discovery for new things in medicine. With your host, Russ Altman. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Manish Agrawala about the future of computer graphics and media. So one of the things that I know you do a lot of work in is what you call computational video editing. When, and as you know very well, when people make movies, they take multiple uh, uh, videos or, or films of the same scene, uh, asking the actors to have different emotions or from a different angle. And there's this challenge of putting it together to be a beautiful, seamless story. What is the state of manual versus uh, automatic editing of these kinds of scenes? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's uh, – when filmmakers are making films, as you said, they take multiple takes. And this is to capture different performances, different emotions. It's also to capture different angles uh, and uh, different, you know, cameras of the same, uh, of the same scene. Um, and uh, then taking all of that raw material and editing it together into a film that is watchable and understandable is a lot of work. Um, and typically what happens is that – people win Oscars for doing a good job at it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and typically what happens is that an editor will start by making a rough cut 
and, you know, uh, getting kind of the major pieces in place and then spending a lot of time refining that. But even generating the rough cut takes a while. And so uh, one of the things that we've worked on is uh, to take a set of raw material, the takes, and the script. And uh, we start by uh, time aligning the raw takes to the script. Okay, so uh, all of them are time aligned and we break up the, the raw uh, takes so that there's a segment associated with each line in the script. Yes. All right. So that already makes it a lot easier to navigate all of the raw material because you can click on a line in the script and see all the different takes. What are and my options for this line? Exactly. Take and, one, take 17. <laughs> yeah. Which one do I like? Yeah. And then you could manually just mark the ones that you like and put it all together into a, a final edit. And that would already be uh, quite helpful. But then the other thing that we've added is uh, higher level tools to do the editing for you. So uh, what you can say is that, you know, this is a typical dialogue scene and I want to start with a wide establishing shot. Uh, so you tell the system that uh, that's how you want to start. Yes. And then uh, you, you might want to say, well, I also want to avoid these kinds of jump cuts that we were talking about yes. earlier. Um, uh, and uh, give the system that instruction. And you might want to say, well, I really want to emphasize uh, Russ in this conversation because he carries a lot of the emotional weight. So if they're short exchanges, just keep the camera focused on, on Russ. His pregnant pauses, his... Uh his amazing ability to uh, inject meaning into words. That's right. That's Things right. like that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so you give these kinds of high-level instructions, and uh, the system then figures out how to choose the individual pieces and put them together uh, according to those instructions and produce – you know, an initial rough edit. <laughs> so we hear a lot about artificial intelligence these days everywhere. I'm hearing, I'm getting the vibe, tell me if this is true, that there's an, a possibility, if not a reality, of underlying AI type technologies recognizing the type of scene, the, the type of thing that you might want to specify. And is that true? Is, are we being fueled by artificial intelligence underneath some of these um, editing tools? That's right. So underneath all of this is a lot of recognition of what's happening in the scene. Um, it's low level recognition, like figuring out where the faces are. Uh, it's understanding the script a little bit uh, to understand how much emotion is being carried by the lines and so on. So it's quite low level. Um, and it's all in the service of the filmmaker. So again, we're not so interested in uh, automatically generating an edit what we are interested in is kind of taking away some of the low-level tedious work and aiding the filmmaker uh, so that this can be maybe a starting point that they can then refine. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and we're speaking with Manish Agrawala, uh, an expert in media and editing. Uh, and, and Manish, as I look at the things you've worked on, I just have to ask you about some of these fascinating projects that may not even be your main focus, but you've, you've published on them and they, they seem interesting. You did something about a, a system called RecipeScape, an interactive tool for analyzing cooking instructions. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. So uh, one of the areas that I work in is, is visualization. And uh, I've always been fascinated by the fact that um, – we have lots and lots of recipes for similar kinds of things. So imagine all of the recipes that we have for cookies right. or for cakes or for pizza or for other things like that. Um, you know, hundreds if not thousands of recipes doing different variations of the same kind of thing. It still winds up being a chocolate chip cookie. Exactly. Um, and so uh, what we built was a tool that would help you understand the variations in these recipes, uh, variations in the ingredients, but also more importantly, variations in the instructions themselves. So there can be, you know, you can uh, have one set of instructions that bake the cookies for 10 minutes, another set of instructions that bake them for 20 minutes, right? Yes. And, uh, and uh, what this work is really aimed at doing is to help you understand all the different variations in these kinds of instructions. 
does it come up with the Uber recipe at the end? Or is it like the editing we were just talking about, not really about replacing the cook's recipe, but just giving them the landscape of what's possible? So it focuses mostly on giving the landscape, uh, but you can get a sense of what the median recipe is. Yes. Right. And that's uh, and that's an interesting thing to look at. This is fascinating because I do a little bit of baking. And when I'm baking something new, I do exactly what you just described. I Google a zillion bagel recipes. And it can be, as you know, probably very well, it can be very useful because if there is an outlier, if I'm about to use a recipe that is telling me to use a tablespoon of salt and everybody else is using a teaspoon or half a teaspoon, I know that there's a bug in that recipe and it's going to be very, very bad. And this has happened to me several times where just looking at the universe of recipes has told me that the one I was about to use would have not been good because of a bug or an error or just a taste that the inventor had that was not standard. So, um, what what happened to that work? <laughs> um, well, it just got put together uh, into a paper that we're publishing at uh, Kai coming up in in. And so uh, we'll be April. seeing it on the Food Network. Um, um, hopefully, any day. <laughs> the, the other thing you've written about is um, something called city forensics. Tell us a little bit about city forensics. I don't have any idea what that would mean. Yeah. So the idea in that work is that. Um, we are starting now, we have been for maybe the last 10 years or so, collecting data about the visual appearance of cities in the form of Google Street View and others that have gone around with cameras and uh, collected all of these, you know, 360 panoramas. Quite comprehensive. Uh, along streets everywhere, you know, that, well, most places that people go. Um, and, and in fact, we've, uh, we also have that over time. So, uh, you know, the, the data now includes uh, a complete set of images uh, from 2005, huh. 2007, uh, all the way up to, you know, the so current like day. So, like, how is Brooklyn evolving mm -hmm. over the last 10, 15 years? Yeah, yeah. And one of the things uh, that we were interested in was understanding how visual appearance of a city might correlate with other kinds of uh, data about ah. the city. So uh, in particular, um, the wealthier parts of a city might have a different appearance than other parts of a city um, or understanding how uh, San Francisco appears differently than a city like Chicago, yes. right? And so uh, this work was really aimed at trying to relate these non-visual uh, yes. types of data to the appearance of the city. So that you, I, I see. So the idea, and that's why the forensics now makes sense, is by mm -hmm. looking at the data that you have, these visual images of the city, you can begin to infer um, more difficult to measure aspects like let's say the obvious ones are poverty level, mm -hmm. uh, the th ways that people in that city like to have fun, the mm -hmm. level of arts and, and leisure, the sports. And, and you can infer a lot of that when you're kind of doing a dossier on what the city is all about and maybe use it for planning. That's right. Exactly. Fantastic. Well, thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you've missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.